again, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Uh, it is my honor to introduce Alifair Burke uh, and then Lisa Unger. So uh, Alifair Burke is a New York Times bestselling author whose most recent novels include The Best Sister, uh, The Wife, which was optioned uh, for a feature film by Amazon, uh, and The X, which was nominated for the Edgar Award for Best Novel. She is also the co-author of the best-selling Under Suspicion series with Mary Higgins Clark. Her new novel, Find Me, uh, comes out in a few months uh, in January of 2022. Uh, a former prosecutor, she now teaches criminal law and lives in Manhattan and uh, East Hampton. And a fun fact I just learned about Alifair is that her mother uh, was a school librarian. Uh, and um, certainly, uh, last but not least, uh, again, my honor to introduce Lisa Unger, who is a New York Times and internationally best-selling author. Her books are published in 26 languages, with millions of copies sold worldwide. Uh, in 2019, she received two Edgar Award nominations, an honor held by only a few writers, including Agatha Christie. Uh, her work has been named on best book lists from Today, People, uh, Good Morning America, Entertainment Weekly, Amazon, IndieBound, and many, many others. Uh, she has written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, NPR, and Travel and Leisure. She lives in Florida with her family. And again, a fun fact that I just learned about Lisa is her mother uh, was also a librarian. So uh, this is uh, making my night tonight. So uh, <laughs> all of us who are uh, here live um, on the Zoom call, those that will be watching on Facebook and those that will watch on demand. Let's give a big virtual round of applause to Lisa and Alifair for joining us here tonight. And, and ladies, you can take it away. Thank you so, so much. Yay. Thank you for that great, great thank introduction. You. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here. Uh, it is my honor and pleasure to be here to be in conversation with my good friend, the very talented Lisa Unger, who's New book is brilliant, Last Girl Ghosted. And uh, I, I think I always tell you, I think this is your best yet, but this one, I think I think this might be my favorite, um, might be my favorite so far. So um, congratulations. Um, so for those. Yeah. Oh, I was just saying, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Should I, um, I appreciate launch you. right in? So sure. for the title, if people looked at it too fast, it's a little blurry and it has the word ghost in it. It is not a ghost story. Um, so for people who don't know what ghosted as a verb means, what is ghosted? So yeah, so ghosted is one of my, one of the words that, well, I mean, I think we probably all know that in the lexicon of <laughs> online dating, it's probably the one we know the most. There's a, there's a, like right. a, a very colorful lexicon that surrounds online dating, but ghosted is basically what happens when, you know, um, you, somebody with whom you have been communicating or somebody you have been seeing um, completely cuts off all contact with you. There's no return text, no return phone calls, you're blocked, maybe even from social media. And so that's what, that's what ghosted means for anyone who's, you know, still thinking it means, you know, Woo! <laughs> it is not a it is not a woo woo book. It is, a it, is online, it is an online dating book. So I'm going to go in reverse order of the three word title. So yeah. who is the girl who gets ghosted? Ren, tell us more about Ren. I will. I'll tell you a little bit about Ren, and I'll tell you about what happens to her. So when we first meet Ren, she we learn pretty early on that she is a, an advice columnist and she's living in New York and she um, comes from a very dark past. She comes from a traumatic past. I mean, of, co of course she does, right? It's a Lisa Unger novel. If we, there wasn't a little <laughs> trauma, we wouldn't know what to do with ourselves. And, um, and she, you know, she, but she's moved on from this life. She has through a series of events that are sort of unfold as the book goes on. She has moved into a life that she has created for herself. And she's successful. She's very successful with a podcast and a blog. And she's, um, you know, she's chosen people who are like the fam, you know, the family that she wants in her life. Um, but her friend, her best friend, Jack kind of is like, you know, you're lonely. You haven't been with anybody in a really long time. And she pushes her into the online dating world and Renz is a little bit reluctant because she's not so sort of, you know she's got some trust issues and so she has a couple of underwhelming encounters and then she meets Adam 
And when she fall, when she falls for Adam, she falls really, really hard. And she thinks it's love. She thinks he's the one. And they have like sort of a white hot romance. And then after a particularly romantic evening, he makes a request. He says, um, tell me something about yourself that you've never told anyone. And she does. And the next day, Adam disappears. Um, his social media profiles are gone. His phone has been disconnected. The place that she thought he lived is just a vacation rental. And then a detective shows up on her doorstep and she learns that there are other women who thought they were in love with Adam. And she was not the she was not the first one to get ghosted by she Adam. Was not the first one to get ghosted. <laughs> she's sure as hell going to make sure she's the last one. So now we are all three words of the title. Now we got now. all three words. Yeah, it, it, it sums <laughs> nice it up to. She's not going to let anyone else get ghosted by Adam again, and she's going to find out the truth about um, what's going on and where he went. Um, it's always hard to talk too much about story and plot with a thriller because you don't want to give things away. But um, one of the interesting decisions I thought you made was, um, <clears throat> out of many of them, is it's not that she, we find out more about Ren, that you referred to her past. We find mm -hmm. out a little more about in real time as she learns things about Adam. You know, we mm -hmm. learn them too. But we also learn more about the women he ghosted and what happened to them um, from their point of view. You know, not not just from what Ren learns about them, but we actually get their backstory too. Um, right. Why was that important to you that we know who these other girls were too? Well, I feel like, you know, I mean, a lot of the things that sort of present in, in the book as choices are not, they're just, they're not really choices, you know, because of the way I, because, or they don't feel like choices, I guess is a better way to put it, you know, because I write without an outline and I don't know who's going to show up day to day and I don't know what they're going to do. You know, I don't really know fully what my book is about and I certainly don't know how it's going to end. So I, you know, I fall, I hear voices, you know, like I have a, like sort of a, a thing that happens where there's like a seed or a germ and then there's like a lot of research that, you know, some, I get obsessed about something and want to learn as much as I can about it. And then I start hearing, I start hearing voices, but, you know, I, I, I heard the voices of these women, you know, um, not as a choice, but just as another layer of the way the story told itself, like my all plot for me flows from character. And so each voice was important because each person is important. I mean, so much in a crime fiction, you know, focuses on the male perpetrator. And, you know, my, I, you know, my books are always about, you know, the people who have maybe been victimized, but they're, they're not necessarily just victims. They have a lot of layers and a lot of reasons why they may have wound up in the position that they wound up. So when I heard these voices, it just felt like a very significant piece of the story, like who they were and how, you know, throughout the progression of the book, without saying too much, each like sort of vignette about the woman, the woman that I'm talking about at the time ends at exactly the same point. Yeah, and so I wanted I that to be almost like a, like a, like breadcrumbs, you know, to how, how Ren was going to progress through the story in a, in a more, in a more flushed out sort of way, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Uh, you said you do a lot of research. What research did you have to do for this book? Did you go well, online dating? Did your husband? Yeah, I did. I went fast? online dating. My husband was like kind of mad about it. No. <laughs> pull from your I had to pull from your experiences with online with online dating I was going to say do you happen to know anybody who met her husband in life <laughs> in fact I wrote about you in one of my little behind my, my little behind the book essay is saying that it doesn't always end horribly in fact for you know my good friend New York Times best-selling author Al Fair Burke you know she met her wonderful husband who's also a really good friend Sean Simpson and they're you know an amazing couple so it's not always it's not always dark and twisted and the subject for a crime novel. Um, but, but I mean, a lot, I mean, it can be. It is for us. You know, the first novel I wrote after I met him was about online dating. So it's like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course we're, 
course that's what we're going to do with it. So of course, I mean, what else? I mean, it's like, we can't even think about anything else except like the dark ending. But, you know, I am, um, I, I had this conversation with a really young friend of mine. And this was like kind of that moment that like germ for the story. And she was talking about how, um, you know, how she just felt that there was like, you know, she'd go on these apps and there's this endless pool of choices. You know, it's like just swipe and swipe and swipe and it's the next one and the next one and the next one. And she asked me, you know, she's like, how do you know? How can you know? How can you ever know if it's the right one, if you pick the right one? And something about that question really kind of stayed with me and it actually kind of haunted me in a way because I thought, God, that's not the, it's just not the right question. And then, you know, she went on to say, you know, um, if somebody shows up in your life or if you show up in their life and somebody is not like exactly what was expected or what you thought somebody was going to be, it's just really easy to ghost that person or to be ghosted, you know, because there's no external ties. Like yeah. the person a stranger before and he is a stranger after he's been ghosted or he's ghosted you. So there's no like, you know, once upon a time that dating pool was really small. It was your town. It was your church. Right. And it's like, but you're not going to wind up sitting next to your Tinder dates, grandmother, you know, in church on Sunday. Right. You know? And so there's so no reason. Yeah. Right. Real world, traditional dating. There was usually some accountability that if somebody does something really, really bad, they're going to have to deal with it because one, you know where to find them, two, but also, you know, their friends, your, your mutual friends who set you up are going to hear about it, or you're going to see them at work and be like, oh, he's a bad guy. And that there was some reason to be accountable, but when it's completely <clears throat> contextless, right, right, then it's possible to just be like, never see, need to see that person again, you know, yeah. ghost to them, um, not even yeah. try to cut be polite about it. Um, right. you, don't even try, you don't even have to try anymore. And I think that, you know, this is, you know, is one of the things, I mean, it, what interests me is not so much, it's not so much the online dating is as how technology has rewritten this kind of ancient pursuit. I mean, like the pursuit for the mate is a, is a primal one, you know, um, and, and now it's, but it's been rewritten and like the pool has gone from this really tiny pool to like a global one. And, you know, it used to be what you wanted from that encounter. It was, you know, the relatively small, predictable choices, you know, courtship, marriage, and now it's just open to any appetite, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, we could what, talk about this all night because yeah. I had a conversation with some friends recently that we almost wonder if the generation of people who primarily date this way if it even changes what they think of as the boundaries of flirtation and the what they you know that yeah. the kind of traditional ways of meeting in person and that sort of slow burn is now much more explicit like that you're actually from the get-go talking about dating instead of having right, instead of meeting your way there in person yeah and feeling yeah. that energy and that vibe <laughs> well I was like you know just a couple of years ago Jeff and I we went to, we went to a nightclub, which was like a very big deal for us because, you know, we're parents and we don't get to do things like that. <laughs> that I don't know, I'm about to say, I don't know the last time I've done that. <laughs> yeah, so we, we went in Miami, we went to a nightclub and we were absolutely blown away by the fact that, at, that nobody was looking at each other. Like yeah, everybody was that's what, that's like, used to be why you went to the club. <laughs> right, <looking laughs> yeah. sure themselves While they were dancing, I was like, wow, that's a problem that because is, like, that, you know, there's that no, is unusual. right. There's no, like there, you know, you go there to connect or you at one point did go there to connect. Um, but that, that has kind of stopped being, you know, um, the important thing. And, and one of the things that sort of came up in my research was this idea, uh, you know, there's like all sorts of phrases and terms that like, just like, you know, that's the other thing that always interests me is the language that springs up around some, you know, some new technology and one of it was uh it was like a hookup is basically could be referred to as a sex interview where uh, so uh, yeah <laughs> so <laughs> instead of meeting somebody and connecting with that person deciding whether you like them enough to have sex with them apparently in modern dating you know um you might meet up you might hook up with somebody and have sex with that person and then decide 
um, if you want to get to know them better based on your sexual that's, account. That's not the traditional order that I grew yeah. up in. <laughs> All of a sudden, here we are, very traditional married ladies. Like, really? That's so strange. But yeah, that's kind of the way. I mean, it does seem to be evolving, you know, in that way. Well, I have to say that, um, you know, part of part of what you have to pull off, you meaning you, <laughs> not one, but you, <laughs> yeah. you, given what you chose to do with your book, like the book doesn't work if she needs to care that she was ghosted, right? Because if right. he's just Absolutely. like a mediocre first date or is someone she really didn't care about, if someone yeah. ghosts you, then you would think the typical reaction would be like, oh, I guess yeah. he was more of a jerk than I thought he was. Right. But like, so she has to really, it has to really feel legit. It has to really feel like a life-changing relationship. And you, because it's a crime novel, like you only have so many pages that make us think that- Make you care. Like we have to care about whether that- like, and she ha- And you have to believe that relationship. That It has cares. to feel real to us. And right. Like, have to believe that it feels real to her and you did that so well like just that you I don't know exactly how you managed to convince me in just a few pages I was like oh this neat like she needs to be in love with him like I had very strong <laughs> feelings about it um, yeah I mean I think that you know so so Ren's voice was the voice the voice that I heard and it was my way into the book and I really didn't know that much about her when I started when I started hearing her, I knew that she had come from this kind of dark place. I knew that she came from, knew that her father was like a doomsday prepper. In fact, well, he calls himself a collapsist, meaning you know that he believes that the world has already ended and that humanity just hasn't figured it out yet. And so that's kind of his, that's kind of his idea about the world. He's a disturbed, he's a disturbed person. He's unstable. And he moves her and her brother and her mother from the, their kind of town life out into this remote property. And, you know, he's doing it because he believes that they are going to survive the, the end days. So she grows up with this like kind of looming darkness. And then, you know, that, that situation unfolds and, you know, she, um, you know, we can't really talk about how, but, you know, after she's moved forward from it, she takes you know, like as we all do from our childhood, takes a big piece of that with her. And even though she's created this life, you know, she's a bit cocooned. You know, she's kind of cocooned herself in her home that she's rebuilding and this life that she has, she hides behind her persona as dear Birdie. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. She hides behind her persona as dear Birdie. And so she's she's really young and fragile and that's how, yeah. in, in some way emotionally she's very fragile and so when she commits to him and when she gives herself over to him and reveals this thing that she really has not shared with anybody it is a big risk you know and I found myself thinking about her like just when I first started talking and started listening to her like she's so attached to him. She's so involved. It's only been three months, but to her, it seems like a long time. And then I realized in the, in the writing of it, that she was actually talking to him. Like she's telling him what happened after he left. And that, you know, made me wonder about her, like, you know, from my perspective on her, like, is like that, it seems it's like, she's so young. Is she unstable? You know, in some way she is, and not that she's an unreliable narrator or anything like that, but she definitely has some, some challenges. And so that's what I felt about her. I didn't even know myself why she was so gutted by, you know, another person might've thought, oh my God, I got lucky, right? These other women disappeared, but I'm still here. So I better just be happy that a worse thing didn't happen, but she doesn't do that. She chases. Don't, don't give too much away. But <laughs> I guess that's not too, going to this way. That's uh, all, that's so, all you, you meant, so you mentioned that she does. So your characters, I, I feel like it's not always the case, but I feel like a lot of times your main character is a creative type, like somebody mm-hmm. who's a writer or so, um, but so she's dear birdie. She has this advice column and nobody actually knows, you know, just like, nobody used to know who right uh, right um but and she can keeps this hidden but it's interesting to me that you you have this woman who as you said is kind of cocooned and in many ways 
a little naive um, and young and her, herself doesn't, she doesn't have that many close relationships. And yet she's the one giving these strangers like such intimate advice. Um, how did you, I mean, I know you said you don't, it's not a decision, but why do you think this character you created, Ren, like that's her job? Well, I feel like, you know, she, I, I feel like in a way, you know, because of the things that unfolded for her and choices that she made to free herself, like I feel like she, it's almost, in some ways it's an act of self-redemption and in other ways you know how if you've moved through some darkness it can be very cathartic to show other people the way through darkness and so i feel like for her that's how she wound up in that space and also i think that you know like you talk about like as as crime writers you and i talk about that have talked about this on stage a lot there's usually something from our lives that really impacted us and had made us have a lot of questions that, and we chose our career because of that. You could say the same thing about probably most psychologists or psychiatrists, you know, get into the work because of things they learned to overcome whatever it is that, that they, that they experienced in their childhoods. And so like it, to me, it felt like a natural sort of thing. Like she's looking for answers for people that are, that are hurting because she, you know, and it, it is a theme that kind of progresses through the book, how she, you know, makes a decision about how she wants to be in the world. You know, at one point, you know, she has to make a decision between like her father who has decided that the world is ending and that the answer is to walk away and save yourself. And she has to come to that. She has to answer that question for herself. Mm -hmm. Like, is the world ending? And if it is, do I walk away or do I stay and help? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's insightful. Um, so her, her father, you mentioned she kind of grew up with this conspiracist uh, yeah. dad who is prepping for end times. Did you, did you go down the rabbit hole? Is that more of the research that you did? Yeah, I mean, oh, I, well, research for me is kind of a continuum. Or you know, are you secretly a prepper and we don't know? I am. I'm secretly. Are, are you in your bomb shelter right now? <laughs> I do. I feel like I need a, I definitely feel like I need a bunker. Like I would, I would totally be into that, you know, sort of, in, but only like in theory, you know, like if I could still get to Nordstrom's or whatever. <laughs> I mean, like a really curated, Instagrammable <laughs> doomsday prepper, if possible, you know, with like with a, 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 a number 10 room rating. Yeah, like a, and like a room rate of a 10. Recipe, mm -hmm. Recipes and stuff and like craft cocktails. So if I could do it that way, like, I would totally be. <laughs> Um, but I do find it very, well, I do find argue, it, arguably we all, we were all living like that for about a year. So. True, true enough. <laughs> A bunker with really good cocktails. That's right. We really got good at that. That's for sure. Um, yeah, I feel like I do. I mean, I guess, I guess the part that I connect to from that is like, and and it's a little bit of a feature of Let Her Be as well, which is the uh, the short story in the. I want to uh, talk about that. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Um, mystery. Lisa's uh, in this. I am I, the best American. Yeah. A lot of amazing writers are in there. It's such a great, such a great anthology. She's the last story, not because she was last to get in, but because her name is Unger. It's alphabetical, but a <laughs> fabulous short story. And this whole collection is really great. So it is. if you it's need it, if you need an extra book to buy. Edited by, uh, edited by Al yeah. Fair. Yeah. And Steph and Cha. Steph Cha. The amazing yeah. Steph Cha. And, um, and yeah, and so there's like, uh, I guess the part of me that I'm, um, I guess connects to that idea is like this, it's like a nostalgia for like the analog life, you know, the record player, the, the radio, you know, the phone that rings, the, the newspaper, you know, the paper book, you know, the, yeah. qui the quiet place, the place where the chatter stops, right? There's an irony that you and I are seeing each other for the umpteenth time, I think, um, virtually and have not been able to see each other in person for two years as you yeah. and I both are the type of people who would have been the last people on earth to have some virtual conversation. Exactly. We you would know? never. Like, 
we're we're the old analog people we can't even talk on the phone we were just talking about that later that's more that's more my fault yeah we're in real life people (laughs) i just want to be together and like go out you know like i was i was when i was doing our post to you know to kind of get the word out there about this i was scrolling back scrolling back looking for the last time we were together which was in 2019 i was like that is not possible and uh and yeah, and I think that it's like, I mean, I, the whole, I mean, once the pandemic hit, I mean, I, you know, I completely pivoted, like where you see me right now, I have been here since March, 2020, <laughs> like right here, literally. And, uh, and I, it's not what I would have chosen. And then also whatever battle, um, you know, we were fighting against the screen you know, was lot, you know, lost completely. And the chatter yeah. is ceaseless. It's right, endless. of course. And um, so- I do want to encourage people to um, start t- typing your questions in, um, in oh, the yeah, Q and A section. Um, there's a separate little bar at the bottom, right? Um, not separate mm-hmm. from the chat and I'll start to incorporate those. But um, I wanted to also follow up on, uh, Robert said that we both had mothers who were librarians. Yeah. Do you think that's a coincidence? Do you think that helped? Did that shape you in any way? Oh, absolutely. Like my, I, I definitely got my love of story from my mom. I mean, not only is she a librarian, but of course, just an, uh, you know, an avid reader, great, great lover of story, you know, and uh, she, my parents always had, you, you know, huge bookshelves and there was no censorship for me. You know, if I could read it, if I could reach it, I could read it you know, no, nobody was even paying attention to what I was reading. And then uh, my mom, you know, my dad's an engineer and my mom, you know, loved the movies and the theater and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, my dad hate, hated all of that stuff and did not want to go to the movies. So I was always her date to the movies. Like even like just, <laughs> as a you little, were the creative partner. <laughs> yeah. As a little kid, you know, like she would just take me to whatever movie figuring like, well, well you'll get what you get. And if you don't, and if it goes over your head, if it, if it's not appropriate for you, it'll just go over your head. Of course it wasn't going over my, (laughs) it wasn't going over my head at all. Um, But I, I definitely, and I also spent a lot of time with my mom at the library because she used to work that like after dinner shift, the seven to nine shift. And this is at the Chester library in New Jersey. And uh, we used to just, um, used to just sit in the, you know, in the library and do my homework and read and just be with her there. And uh, like, I just, my whole life, I just felt, you know, surrounded by books and by stories. And it was really my first, you know, my first love and the first place I ever felt like at home was like in the pages of a book, you know, because we traveled a lot. So I'd I'd echo that my mom would take me to the library every uh, weekend to get a new pile of books. And yeah. I didn't realize that part of the reason why she was taking me to the library is my dad is a writer. He needed to write. Yeah. And, and I was, just, yeah, I was just, the he youngest kid. I was the youngest kid by far. So like, she had to like, keep me entertained so he could have some weekend time to write. And right. it was a place you could go for free and keep some kid entertained. So it's kind of interesting while she was helping him be a writer. Right. She was, she was creating a little, right. She was yeah, creating right. another little writer. So, yeah. um, so there are some questions rolling in. So how long does it take you to write a book? And I think that's for both of us. Yeah, so it takes me about nine to 12 months to do a first draft, um, which in a first draft is really like, I don't know, it's like four or five or six drafts before it gets turned into my editor. And then from that point, you know, it's about another year before it winds up on the shelf. So there's like a editorial phase and, you know, proofreading, copy editing, you know, all of the, all of the many different phases. So I always say it's nine months, nine to 12 months, but um, it's really more like a, it's more like more like a two-year process, I guess, from start, you know. And and you kind of find the book while you write, right? Like, so are you writing pretty much the whole time as opposed to like, I'm going to take four months planning this out and then write? Oh no, I'm always writing. Like, in fact, you know, like the, you know, the book, I just finished my 20th novel. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. That, that did really feel like kind of a big deal, but that really did. So I I think um, we're on pace. I did too. So we're (laughs) awesome. (laughs) We're all square when we are finally together. That's what we will celebrate. Our (laughs) Yeah. If they both come out the same year, then we'll be, (laughs) is not your, is not number 20 though. Right. 
if you count my co-authored series yeah it's 20 <gasps> it is yeah <laughs> but that's kind of cheating because somebody else helped me write six of them <laughs> there's, there's no cheating. I know. 20 20 <laughs> books with my name on it so. um, that's amazing well congratulations congratulations and um and do you have a favorite Sandra's asking a favorite book of your own novel <gasps> No, you can never I, say, I, I know I could never choose a favorite book. I do have people that come back, you know, I do have people that, that kind of, you know, and, and I have a fictional town called the hollows. Yes. Which, it's on my know, list of things. You keep picking like, come on. It's my <laughs> question for you. <laughs> is that, is Go tell like, us. The hollows, but, you, you know, keep coming back to hollows. You keep coming yeah. back to the character from the hollows called Jones Cooper, but it turns yeah. out that Ren Ren has a connection. So did you know going in no. that Jones Cooper and the Hollows were going to appear or no. you just, you were writing a standalone and there they were? Yeah. Well, the Hollows is always trying to get in to every story. Like, I don't know why, <laughs> like it just wants to be in every book and it can't be, it's not in every book. And, you know, there are books that are specifically Hollows books and they're connected. They're not, it's not a series, it's, but they're like chain linked by character an event and uh and Jones Cooper is one of those people and uh yeah and I had no intention of including the hollows or Jones Cooper it was never a thought in my head until we wound up in the hollows and Jones Cooper showed up <laughs> <laughs> well it worked really well I thought it was a nice it's something that would not you know, if somebody's not read any of those books or right. isn't keeping track of the hollows or Jones Cooper, it reads like a standalone, but, but for people who know your work more closely and know your, that recurring theme and the series, it's a nice yeah. little Easter egg. And, um, Laura Lippman did that recently, um, uh, in dream girl, which is a standalone mm -hmm. suddenly Tess Monahan's there. So, and it, it, if you have no idea who P.I. Tess Monahan is, then right. it just seems like at some point someone talks to a private investigator, but for people who really miss Tess, it's, it's a nice like reunion. Yeah, and I got a little bit of a, a surprise like that too in your book and find me. Yeah. I just finished. It is fantastic, of course. It is just, you know, smart, twisty, layered, all, all the things. Thank you. Made. And then, you know, so we're getting, I was, I kept texting you. I was like, oh, I love Lindsay. Oh, I like Carter. And, uh, and you're like, just wait. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. And then I was, I was really excited to see Ellie Hatcher um, come back in this book. And I know that, you know, she has like kind of an ongoing arc, an ongoing arc and it was an it was some somewhat like a somewhat unresolved arc that I know I knew that at some point you were gonna go back to that. Was that this moment for you? Is that intentional, or did that just kind of evolve in the writing of Find Me? Uh, no, it, that was she did not just appear. It was actually um, like I've had now a few books like the plot because I think I I plot out not everything, but like, I kind of need to know what's going on before I can start writing or right, right. I, I wind up making myself crazy. So, um, I had an Ellie Hatcher book in mind or it more, more the whole time I've known Ellie, like there's something right. I wanted to have happen with Ellie. And I wasn't ever quite sure how that was going to get there. And then on top of that, I had an idea that became find me of a woman who loses her memory, has to start over again, and then goes missing again, and nobody knows what happened to her. And somehow those two like got together. <laughs> like, it's like, like someone's peanut butter ran into someone's chocolate and suddenly <laughs> you had this delicious confection. Um, they just sort of found each other. Um, and I'm sorry, I did delete one person's question. I'm sorry, because it had a major spoiler in it. So I please, when you ask your questions, don't reveal. Um, things most the books just came out so most people probably haven't read it yet um uh jill shoemaker asks if the book's a cautionary tale of sorts and heidi uh, gabrielson asks kind of a related question about um have whether real online dating um informs the storyline because we both we both happen to write mysteries with um, <laughs> bad guys who look for people online. So, um, is it a cautionary tale? And 
I think you and I already talked about our own um, experience with <laughs> online dating crazy. that I have it and she doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> She met her husband in real life. It was life. a cautionary tale, right? I mean, like, I don't ever sit down to write anything like that. And I don't, I don't see, like, obviously you can find love um, no matter where you're looking for it. If that's really what you're looking for, you can also find other, you can also find ways to satisfy other darker app appetites, or there's all different ways to find a victim or to be victimized. And if this is just one more way um, to, to do that. And, you know, the potential for deception is much higher, um, but that could be said of that's true of any, you know, sort of online encounter, social media, et cetera. So I don't know, it's necessarily a cautionary tale. The book itself, I think encourages, or, you know, the, one of the major themes is that, you know, the, the relationships between people are, are real world relationships, you know, we connect by being, by being together, by seeing each other, by talking to each other, by, you know, honestly, um, you know, interacting with each other and, you know, connection is made, you know, from a place of, from a place of openness and real relationships are messy and complicated and conversations are hard sometimes. Um, but that's real life. Those are the real relationships. Like the, your real life is what's happening between your curated Instagram posts yeah. and between, you know, and after you've taken that online relationship into the real world, that's real life. So I think if anything, the theme is that, you know, it's don't let technology rewrite what we truly need from each other. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, another question for you, Ruth Nickerson would like to know if you're working on a new book and what are you willing to say about what it's about? <laughs> I, I can't say anything about it. It is done. I did I did finish my 20th novel and it is um, with my with my editor <laughs> at the moment. It's with the doctor okay. in the hospital at the moment. And, uh, <laughs> and it'll come back and we'll see if we can if we can uh, resuscitate it when it gets back to me. And uh, I, but I never talk about anything until it's completely until it's completely finished. Yeah. Um, because otherwise I feel like the energy of there's like an engine and an energy and a drive uh, for me internally that, you know, like there's, a, I don't want to, I don't want any of that to diminish. Like there's an intensity to my involvement with the book. And I sometimes feel like if you talk about it, then all the energy goes into that conversation and not into the page. Um, but when did you start? Oh, good. I just, when did you start yeah. writing your first book? Oh, uh, when I, my, I started, well, I've always been a writer. I've been a writer since I was a kid. Um, but I began my first novel when I was 19 years old. I started it while I was still in college. Um, and it took me a really long time to finish it. It took me almost 10 years <laughs> to finish that book. Um, because I was, you know, I, when I graduated from, from college, I, um, I didn't like, didn't have a confidence, even though I knew that's what I was. And I, I always knew that's what I was, but you know, my dad, again, was an engineer. And, you know, when the topic came up that maybe I was a writer, the answer to that was like, yeah, no, that's not a job. That's not a real job. People <laughs> so get a real job. Like I'm paying. Does he, how does he feel that you tell everybody that story now as a best-selling novelist of 20 novels <laughs> he loves it I think he really loves it and my poor dad I, I'm like I'm like the equation that you know just doesn't work like he just still can't solve it you know <laughs> even though he keeps trying um but I you know he he's happy he's proud but he's you know oh there's Jack Jack um yeah really but he just doesn't you know he still doesn't totally get me <laughs> I, I, can we can we get a better look at Jack Jack Absolutely. There he is. Hi, buddy. Hey. Aw. There he is. Miss you, buddy. Find your stuff. Find your stuff. There he goes. Okay, he's good. I've I've got a dog sitting on my feet right now. Yeah, double. I saw I saw it's raining and double yeah. walking around behind. <laughs> um <laughs> Teresa Myers is asking both of us, this one's for both of us, what's the best piece of writing advice you received that you still use in your own writing? Hmm. You go first, Alfred. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, very early on, it was actually not even a novelist. It was an academic, a, a professor said, you know, the way to, to be 
be a successful working writer, you need to treat yourself like a successful working writer, even though you're not there yet and kind of fake it till you make it. But that means give yourself a room, for example, or a desk or designated space, right? A room of her own. It means that you have to, yeah. you can't treat it like a hobby, right? You can't, you have to treat it like a job, even though nobody's paying you yet. You've got to create time. It means having to tell your family sometimes, even if they are like, oh, isn't that cute? You're trying to write a book, which is how most people respond right. when someone who's not yet published is working on a book. But you have to kind of create those boundaries to give yourself the time, but then you also have to do the work, like you treat it like a job um, and just get words down on the page. And, you know, even 20 books in, I still have to remind myself, I told you I take too long thinking about things before I start writing. And I regret it every single time because the reality is that it's so much easier to rewrite and make things better than it is to build it up from scratch. So if, you know, if you write a few pages every day in a year, you're going to have a manuscript um, exactly. if you stay at it. So yeah. how about you, Lisa? Yeah, I mean, I try to think about the best writing advice I ever received because, you know, I, I feel like I've always, I've always just been, I've always been this, like my brain has always just worked this way. But I think that probably if I had to pick something, it would actually be a book um, called The Artist's Way. And it's written by a, a woman named Julia Cameron. And she also has another book called The Right to Write, which is kind of in line with the advice that you received, where she says that, you know, we treat our unpublished writers as if they have an embarrassing case of unrequited love, you know, like as if they, you know, think they might marry Tom Cruise or something like that, you know, and that there's not a lot of space, you know, given to the writer who's trying, who's aspiring. And so, you know, what the, basically the book itself is like, a, is like a class and it, um, it teaches you how to, just connect to that writer self, you know, with various things like the morning pages where you just sit up, you just get up in the morning and start to write, which is something that, you know, I have always done. And, um, or you take yourself on an artist date, which is like, you go to anything that's like creative or like a museum or like a, you know, a, you know, or a play, whatever it is that nourishes you creatively or like gives you that creative spark. Um, you go and do that. And so that book was really, you know, something that I go back to again and again, whenever I like sort of need, um, you know, inspiration or like sort of, you know, just reassurance or whatever it is. There are a couple of books like that, that I kind of go back to again and again, like uh, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott is another one I kind of go to. Like, it's one of those books where you just open it and like just randomly and like whatever page you owe, it's like the I Ching, like whatever page you open it to, like that's the advice you needed. <laughs> like, I kind of feel like that those books are like those kind of books for me. Are you surprised sometimes like when ideas hit you? Like, and I don't even mean like an idea like, oh, that's my whole next book, but just right. like there's little things like you think yeah. that you're watching a movie or you think you're cooking dinner and just you don't even think you think you're taking time off from your book and that's when it opens up. Does that make totally. sense? Yeah, all yeah. the time. I mean, that's how I, that's how I write every single book. <laughs> <laughs> I wait for those moments. You, like, ign you ignore it and wait for it. To <laughs> yeah. No, it's like part of that. It's like part of that process for me. It's like, you know, you have to be present for the work you know, uh, you have to be present for, you have to set the time, honor the time, honor the schedule, right? Like that's a baseline. And then, you know, you have these moments where you're there and the, it's perfect, you know, the cre creativity is on, everything's flowing, it's great. And then you have these moments where you're like, okay, so how long are we just going to sit here until I figure out what's going to happen next, or I'm going to figure something out or right. something. And then you're like, well, okay, I'm just going to go to the gym, right? Because sometimes you can't just sit there. You can for a while, but then eventually if you, you have to, it's almost like you have to shake it loose somehow. So you can, you can't get yeah, on yeah. social media. You can't do any of that. That's garbage, true. But you've you, got to quiet your brain down. Right. Yeah. You can go to the gym. You can bake a cake. You can do right. the laundry. You can do things like that. And then when you're doing that, that's when you're going to get the next. It is. It yeah, is always. the strangest phenomenon. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's hard because sometimes I'll be like, oh, I'm stuck. I'm going to go to the gym and I think I'm procrastinating, but yeah. enough times it's actually worked out. Absolutely. It doesn't, you're right though. You're not going to find it 
talk no to Twitter. on Twitter no and Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guarantee no one ever had no one ever had an epiphany while reading tweets um <laughs> as much as I love to read and write tweets um uh, Elizabeth Hess was asking um is, is there a certain type of character that you find most challenging to write or you said you said and I've heard you talk about this before that you find plot through character and it's always the characters who are leading you on the way yeah but are some of them like just kind of showing you the way and you have to like yeah, it's no difficult to I mean you know it's all me right I mean this is just the way I experience it you know it's just like right. it's, how, it's how it is for me but I know it's all me I mean it's not that I'm just I'm not just channeling voices you know I'm a writer with a craft I have an education yeah. my whole life to get better right. at this every day I mean for real and I know, you know, I know how seriously that. you take it yeah there is that you know but I experience it in this in this other way so I don't ever feel like even my worst characters even the most broken addicted you know delusional you know even bad or evil characters they all sort of speak to me and I and I definitely do listen you know I definitely have um you know, empathy for, for all of them. And I don't really, I mean, I, I, I can't recall, like, I feel like that's a top down or like an outside in thing. Like, oh, how do I make this character do what I want them to do? Or like, I have the chessboard set up and how do I move these pieces around the chessboard? I do not experience the work that way. I am, I am inside looking out. I'm not above looking down. And so that's how every, how everything works for me. There are some characters that are very dark and that when I'm done with them, you know, I still feel, I still feel that, but, you know, I live in the light. I compartmentalize, you know, the person who sits down to write is not the person who gets up and goes to pick my daughter up from, from school. Yeah. They're different people. Uh, and then Judy asked what each of us is reading right now. Oh, yeah. Or a book to recommend. Well, <laughs> well, well lucky me, I get another plug. I just I'll finished this it. fantastic book. I'm sure, you can, I'm sure you can pre order from Haley Booksellers, just saying. Um, you'll definitely want to read it. Um, I know that you're a fan of another book that I just finished. Uh, well, actually, not just about a couple months ago, uh, Allison Galen's The Collective. I was going to recommend that same one. Um, that's a really good book. And uh, tomorrow night, I'm going to be appearing um, at the Cuyahoga Library with Hank Phillippe Ryan. I just finished her book, Her Perfect Life. Um, also an excellent thriller. Um, Hank is, you know, she's a powerhouse and uh, we'll be hanging out tomorrow night. So uh, yeah, and I'm also just always kind of continuously reading. I have like not books that I'm reading for research right now, which are really taking up a lot of, a lot of bandwidth, but I can't talk about them without talking about the book that I'm working on. So I can't talk about those books, but uh, we'll talk about them when I'm talking about that book <laughs> next year. <laughs> So I, uh, I have a book event to plug too, if you're doing one with Hank. Um, yes. I'm interviewing Tamarin Hall, of TV's Tamarin Hall, okay. wrote a debut mystery novel. Awesome. So very good. And it's called As the Wicked Watch. For mm -hmm. those of you who are wondering, I was not texting oh. while I was, was I was reminding myself the title and the date, As the Wicked Watch <laughs> in, in, two, <laughs> in two weeks. Um, two Wednesdays from now, I'll be, uh, I think, um, through Barnes and Noble, they're doing like a national chat that's free. I think it's at awesome. in the afternoon. I think it's at the free afternoon. And then I'm reading. I, I would also highly recommend Allison Galen's book, The Collective. I, the and I'm currently I just starting um, Janelle Brown's forthcoming book next year. It won't come out till next year. Called I'll Be You. Mm. So keep an eye out for that. That's my current read. But there's always there's so many good books out there. Well, there's a Crazy. lot of, there's just a lot of talent and we have, and we have like a lot of really talented friends. Which yeah. Is, we, there's not a dud. Right. I, mean, I wonder why that is. is it, okay. What's the theory there? So we were saying we have a lot of writer friends and they're actually like, I mean, not all writers are like yeah. able to write 20 good books, you know, some people, but right. it seems like all of our friends are doing like, really well and the books, the books get better and better. So do yeah. we not, do we, do we meet? 
not as good writers and we don't like them or do we are we biased or are we just drawn to each other i think this might be a, this might be a dinner conversation yeah like i'm like yeah that's really true if you look at our group of friends we're all really good writers yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have some really super talented friends and a lot of fun and yeah. a lot of fun times together too which i'm yeah like need to kind of get back to that you know yeah i think uh, okay. um, uh, and and on that note are you doing any in-person things uh book mm -hmm. events or is it all virtual still i did i had two live in-person events here in florida i had a, a launch event at tom Below books um in uh in st pete which is like my just you know one yeah. one of two fantastic independent stores that we have here um, and the, I did another live event, both of them quite big, um, which was a little bit weird, but, you know, kind of exciting at the same time uh, at Oxford Exchange in Tampa. And while I was in Tampa, I met a friend of, of Michael Connolly's who's there and she was talking about you and saying that we need to get you, Michael Carita and Michael Connolly in Tampa so that we could do like a thriller panel at Oxford Exchange. So uh, that would be great. You oh, know, we fun. like to, uh, that crew likes to go down to Tampa. Yeah. <laughs> we have fun. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. So I did do um, some live events and they, the, my launch event at Tombola Books was my first live event since March 2020. So well, congratulations. Yeah. You deserve Thanks. to have these big virtual events and you also deserve to have the in-person ones and we appreciate you doing it. And I, I love it. I do. Get to hear more about behind the scenes of the book. Get to see you and Jack Jack. Jack Jack. He's puppy. Gonna, gonna walk over. And I think I think I got all the questions and I don't think I missed anything. Um, awesome. Robert, should we turn it over to you? Great. Well, thank you so much, Ella Fair, and thank you so, so much, Lisa. Uh, you both did a wonderful job, as always, thank you, and as everyone. expected. Yeah. yeah, and it was nice to meet Jack Jack as well. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so just want to uh, remind folks who are live with us, uh, you'll be receiving an email tomorrow with a link to a feedback survey, a link to Haley Books uh, to purchase an autographed copy of um, Last Girl Ghosted, and um, also a link to tonight's recording. So um, uh, please keep an eye out for that. I want to thank um, uh, Emmer Flounders. I want to thank Dick Haley. And I want to thank the other 24 libraries for partnering with Tewksbury tonight. Uh, certainly want to thank all the participants uh, here live. And most of all, once again, want to thank Alifair and Lisa for a wonderful evening. So thank you all so, so much. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their evening. And go Red Sox. Hey. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Alifair. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Alifair. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye.